everyone. I'm Dr. Margaret Bordeaux. I'm the Research Director at Harvard Medical School Program in Global Public Policy. And I'm here to welcome you to our second COVID response seminar, Organizing, Budgeting, and Implementing Wraparound Services for People in Quarantine and Isolation. This series is co-run by Harvard Medical School's Program in Global Public Policy, as well as Harvard University's Berkman Klein Center uh, for Internet and Society. And it's also co-sponsored by the National Governors Association. The purpose of this series is to tackle issues regarding implementation and COVID response policy. Um, so we really seek to showcase the work of implementers so as to support those standing up or building upon COVID response programs in their own states and in their own communities. And the topic uh, of today's seminar is supported quarantine and isolation programs. And some of the questions that we're hoping to tackle today, go ahead and share my screen here. I'll really include the following. So what we wanna talk about today is of course, what is supported quarantine and isolation and why is it important? Um, how are quarantine and isolation uh, programs set up and managed? And what is their value and what do they cost? And how does one get started or how does one build upon uh, the resources that have already been established in the state uh, in terms of uh, building these programs out? So today I'm enormously excited to have a panel of incredible guests uh, with us from around the country that are gonna help us answer some of these, uh, some of these questions. I do wanna go through a brief sort of run of show with everyone uh, and give some brief introductions to the folks um, that are going to be with us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and lead off by giving a kind of overview of uh, what we mean when we talk about supported uh, quarantine isolation, how it fits into a broader strategy of COVID response. Um, and then I'm going to turn, turn it over to Dr. Saira Madad and Dr. Amanda Johnson, who are both uh, leaders of New York City's Health and Hospitals, the largest network of public health facilities and hospitals in the country. Uh, and they are both deeply involved in setting up home-based as well as facility-based quarantine and isolation support services in New York City. And then we're going to pass the mic to another dynamic duo, uh, Dr. Mia Lazada and Dr. Jenny Wei, both doctors at the Indian Health Service in Gallup, New Mexico, in the Navajo area, and who've both also been uh, deeply involved in standing up very impressive, expansive programs, both again, facility-based and home-based uh, quarantine isolation programs uh, there. Um, to bring us home, uh, we'll turn over to Dr. Linda Bilmes, the Daniel Patrick Moynihan Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School, a former Assistant Secretary of Commerce, and a leading expert on budgeting and public finance. And she's going to lead us on a discussion of how to think about supported quarantine isolation programs from a budgeter's point of view. Uh, what its value is, what it costs, and how to think about investing in these efforts. Um, one final introduction uh, is of student Jessica Kushal. She's a student both at Harvard Kennedy School and Stanford, who has led a paper with myself and Dr. Vilmez on, uh, that just came out today uh, on estimating uh, the cost of quarantine and isolation services in Massachusetts versus the cost of not uh, investing in those programs. And she'll be joining us uh, for the question and answer period after the session. Uh, so with that uh, stellar crew in mind, um, I'm going to go over some basics. So the first question I often get uh, when I bring up quarantine isolation at this moment in the pandemic is, why are we talking about this? Uh, aren't vaccines here? And isn't this going to be over soon? And I would say I've, I've sort of been hearing uh, that um, uh, thought of uh, really for about uh, 18 months <laughs> where folks have been saying this has got to this isn't going to be bad this is this is going to be over soon and I think um, one of the things I would say is I am very very optimistic about vaccines and I do think they're going to uh, make a significant dent in transmission and uh, bringing it about the end of this crisis 
But I would say that if you really take an honest look at what our public health strategy has been to date across the country, it still remains pretty crude. And that is coming from somebody who has worked nonstop on public health strategies uh, in response to COVID um, uh, for the entire for the entire year. Um, and so, you know, while we're waiting for vaccines to roll out, we really have to uh, get more sophisticated about the public health strategies that we're using. Right now, we really are relying on on public health strategies that, at their core, are about um, lockdowns, shutdowns, closing uh, schools, closing businesses, closing places, uh, and those do work, but they're very, very onerous. So the, the reason we need to talk about um, quarantine and isolation in particular is so that we can get a, a more nuanced uh, approach and less onerous approach to our non-vaccine public health strategy. And um, the second issue, of course, is that we are hearing a lot about variants, uh, viral variants that are emerging that may potentially diminish the effectiveness of our vaccines. And the third issue is even if our vaccine strategy is completely perfect, we're still going to have outbreaks of COVID very likely um, uh, in the future over the next year or so. So now is the time to really power up our non-vaccine public health strategy. And what do I mean by our non-vaccine public health strategy? You've probably heard a lot of different analogies and sort of ideas about what a, a good public health strategy is in respect to COVID. I love the, um, the Swiss cheese model, you know, where you layer defenses, where you try to make sure there's all, all your holes in your Swiss cheese are covered or the lasagna strategy where you're layering on layers of protection. I think that's fantastic. Um, I also really like the analogy of the three-legged stool. And I like it because it talks about different elements of the public health strategy as being interconnected and dependent upon one another. Um, and just briefly to give you a sense, you know, on one leg of the stool, we have, we modify our environment. What are the things that we can do to change the environment so to make transmission less likely? And here, you know, with respect to COVID, we're looking at things like, well, improving ventilation and air filtration and closed spaces, as an example. You know, in the other leg over here, we have modifying behavior. These are things that we ask sort of everyone to do or a huge number of people to do uh, in order to um, drive down transmission. Here, you know, the most uh, relevant example probably with respect to COVID is we ask people to wear masks. And um, that's for the general population. This yellow leg here that I've highlighted in yellow is the third leg of the stool, and that's contact tracing. And contact tracing is a process by which you identify who is infected, you identify the folks that they have exposed to the disease, and then you ask those folks to either quarantine or isolate so that they don't transmit the disease forward. And that's a very specific, um, uh, exercise where you're really chasing down and trying to break individual chains of transmission. It's a much more refined uh, approach than these other approaches, which are a little bit broader and involve a lot of folks. Um, and of course, the top of the stool is public health intelligence. That's when you take your data and you understand if what you're doing in these three different legs are working and you refine them. Um, and so we're, when we talk about quarantine isolation, we're really talking about it predominantly as a strategy that is part of contact tracing. And I would just submit to you to think about it um, as the uh, defining intervention of contact tracing. You can test and you can trace uh, contacts, but unless you're really asking folks to stay away from others, it's not going to have that much of an impact. So what is quarantine versus isolation? I keep using both of those words. So just to review a little bit for folks, um, they're a little different. Um, so the goal of quarantine is to keep people who've been exposed to the virus away from others until it can be determined that they are not in fact infected. For isolation refers to the practice of keeping people who you know to be infected away from others so that they cannot transmit. The duration for these is a little different. And just two days ago, the CDC came out with refined guidance on how long these should last. Um, the duration for quarantine remains at around uh, 14 days, but it can be shortened to seven days if you get a test, 
48 hours, be, that's negative 48 hours before that seven day days is up or 10 days uh, without a test. Isolation is uh, recommended for 10 days after the onset of symptoms or if you never have symptoms, 10 days after the po a positive test and at least 24 hours after fever has resolved. And it can last uh, longer than that for very sick or immunocompromised patients. The contexts in which you're asking people to quarantine or isolate also vary a little bit. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, quarantine is often, uh, folks that you ask to quarantine are often identified through the contact tracing program. Um, and there's also uh, increased practice of asking folks who are crossing uh, state lines or country lines to uh, travelers to quarantine for a certain period of time as well. Isolation is really for anyone who's been diagnosed with, uh, um, with infection. So what does this issue around supported mean? And here is, and I like to tell a story uh, from back in April, 2020, when uh, Massachusetts was just starting to get its contact tracing program up and running. And I, I had a friend that lives down the street from me who told me this story. And she said, she, she's a midwife and she uh, had just come from, uh, from the office where she had encountered a uh, young woman who was uh, about 25 weeks pregnant. And uh, the young woman for just come in for a routine visit, but she noticed that the young woman was coughing. And she said, oh, you know, do you think you could have COVID? And the, and the woman said, boy, I, I think I might because I actually live at home with two parents, uh, my two parents uh, and my young toddler and everyone in the house is, is sick. Um, and uh, the, so the midwife, you know, sends off a, a, a test and it comes back a day later at that point um, as positive. And so she calls the young woman and she says, you know, goes, talks to her for an hour, talks to her and says, you know, you really have to stay apart from others. You have to stay at home. You know, you really have to isolate. Um, and, uh, and the young woman is, is quite very worried um, and absolutely taking it seriously. And, you know, they go through how they're going to organize the bathroom and the toothbrushes and how they're going to make the inside, you know, of the house as, as safe as possible. Anyway, the midwife hangs up the phone after about an hour and goes to the grocery store. And in the grocery store, lo and behold, is the young woman uh, that she's just talked to, who she knows to be positive. And she says, oh my gosh, you know, what, what are you doing here? And, and the young woman said, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I'm the wellest person in my household and I need to get groceries. Um, and, you know, it was, it was so obvious that that was, in fact, would be a very natural need. Um, but, you know, it really was a surprise. Um, here was somebody who took the, the, the epidemic very seriously, was very worried about it, and yet was unable to uh, to, under, to, to have a success, successfully immediately quarantine. And so this issue of support is essentially what do folks need uh, to quarantine and isolate successfully? What are the services that need to be in place so that they can actually succeed and that this can be an effective disease control strategy? So there has been some uh, interesting work done on uh, looking at adherence to quarantine isolation. It's not a vast literature, but it, but it is an interesting one where they've you know, done studies of why do people break isolation or quarantine in different contexts. And it's, it's pretty uh, interesting that in that literature, it's pretty obvious that there are a couple of, of basic things that jump out that are common through all studies of this. Um, folks need to get food and necessities. They need to keep a job and earn some money. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, so they will break if they if they can't uh, if they if they can't sustain that. Um, some folks have no safe place to stay. Uh, either they don't have a place at all. Maybe they have um, a problem with homelessness, um, or they are living uh, in a in a situation that is simply not safe for them to um, to to stay in for the entire duration. Um, or they have to fulfill social and family obligations that they uh, can't figure a way out of, uh, can't figure a way to do uh, from, from their homes. So with those sort of things in mind, um, really designing a supported quarantine and isolation program, um, you know, helps kind of set, uh, set us up for thinking through some of these requirements. Um, and just on the last note, so, so there's sort of two flavors, if you will, of uh, quarantine isolation support programs. 
Um, one is uh, home-based and the other is facility-based. Um, and so the home-based option is really, uh, by and large, what is unfolded in, in Massachusetts. There have been some facility-based um, isolation and quarantine uh, programs. But in general, folks here um, have uh, done undertaken a quarantine isolation from home. Um, and uh, how the state of Massachusetts has chosen to organize uh, uh, some of its program is through its contact tracing program. So when they reach out to somebody who is infected or who has been exposed, they'll go through a questionnaire and ask them, you know, what do they need in order to undertake a successful quarantine? And they have found that um, when folks uh, identify a major barrier to successfully completing it, they will then um, uh, kick the case up to a, a cadre of case resource managers, folks who will take on the case and, and, and work with the person over time to address those challenges. Um, and, uh, and that's been nice. I think the issue has been that usually case resource managers have to cobble together local resources in order to make it work for the person in quarantine isolation. I think there's a lot of uh, thought now about how can we make it more standard, the supports more um, generous and more routine um, to make it even make it even better. And then the second flavor is the facility-based quarantine. And there's a bunch of different sort of sub flavors of this, but one approach has really been to use hotels um, as uh, safe spaces uh, to quarantine or isolate. Um, and on that note, I would love to turn it over to um, Dr. Madad and Dr. Johnson, who again are some of the leaders at New York City's Health and Hospitals, the large network of um, public health um, facilities and hospitals in the country. And uh, they have um, are here to talk about the New York City experience and uh, how they have run their, their program there. Thank you so much, Dr. Bordeaux. Thank you so much uh, to the Berkman Klein Center for having us here today. We're just gonna do a brief slide transition and then we are really excited to talk to you a little bit about how we're approaching this work in New York City. Um, just to orient folks to the pandemic response in New York City, the public health effort that we entered into as of June of this year um, is encapsulating what we call our test and trace core. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Madad. Um, so, yes, great. Um, so our test and trace core has three pillars, um, and this is reminiscent of the slide that Dr. Bordeaux shared earlier, in which we have an extensive community testing uh, operation. We have a community-based uh, contact tracing outfit, as well as one that is focused on facilities or congregate settings. And then the last portion, um, the pillar that I'm the director of, is our take care pillar. And we're responsible for ensuring that people who are exposed to or are diagnosed or develop symptoms consistent with COVID-19, have uh, everything that they would need in order to effectively and safely separate from individuals in their households, individuals in their community, individuals in their workplace. Um, I think one of the themes of this uh, program is to talk a little bit about organizational structure and leadership. And so I wanna call out that the New York City Test and Trace Corps um, was commissioned by our city leadership and is a partnership between our Department of Public Health, that's the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, um, as well as New York City Health and Hospitals, which is our public healthcare delivery system. Um, and so really being able to leverage the expertise of both of these sections, as well as many other city agencies who have really stepped up to uh, help us combat the pandemic in New York City. Um, I'll highlight those as we go. And so um, in our take care pillar, we support people both in our hotel program, as well as those who choose to isolate or quarantine at home. Now, even down to the scripts that we use in our contact tracing, there's a little bit of choice architecture here. We promote the hotel above home isolation or quarantine um, whenever possible. If you look at a map of New York City and you see the distribution of cases and contacts, across our five boroughs, you'll notice a few things. You'll notice this overlap of multi-generational households, of households overcrowding with places where we have the highest positivity rates. Probably not surprising to this audience that these are also parts of our city that uh, have greater underrepresented minorities, um, people of color, as well as people who are uh, in jobs that don't allow them the luxury of working from home, where people are on public transportation and coming into Manhattan um, in order to be able to earn a living. Um, and uh, places where we know that there is just uh, greater indices of poverty. And so truly really there's a, an equity focus to how we've organized the, the work that we're doing. Um, 
we try to promote the hotel at all costs because of many of those environmental factors. Sorry, busy Manhattan Street outside. We try to promote the hotel over um, uh, home isolation, but we know that for a variety of reasons, it's not gonna be the right choice for everyone. So to that end, uh, we have put together our resource navigation program that allows people to safely separate at home. Um, in this effort, we work with over 400 resource navigators who are directly employed by a, a handful of community-based organizations, some of which are represented here. And when someone completes their contact tracing interview, they are referred over to a resource navigator. If they screen positive or identify a need for a few high, uh, yield resources, some of the things that uh, Dr. Bordeaux brought up that are commonly needed for people to be able to isolate or quarantine if they choose to stay at home, um, as well as someone who has any identified any other unmet need. And it's true that it is uh, a little bit of cobbling together both citywide resources as well as local resources, but something that I think has really worked to our advantage in terms of being able to provide curated and resonant resources to the very diverse population that we're trying to serve is the fact that we've brought together community-based organizations that span the five boroughs and have different niches, have different uh, local expertise that they bring to bear in, this, in their conversation with these uh, individuals. Even aside from language affinity, just being able to actually know the neighborhood that they're serving, I think it's gone a long way toward building trust, and maintaining trust through our program. Um, one thing that I do want to call out is that um, people who have been identified through contact tracing are eligible for both hotel and home services, but we also um, sometimes seek to invert this test, trace, and then isolate and quarantine paradigm. If we're waiting for test results to come back, if we're waiting for individuals to be contact tracing, we're missing valuable days, and we know that transmission can happen very, and does happen very early on in somebody's course of illness. So to that end, we have also built up a COVID-19 hotline so that people can call in and proactively request resources such as hoteling, um, such as support for isolating at home. And to say a little bit more about how this uh, at-home program is structured, we do work with these CBOs, but they're all governed by uh, the Mayor's Office of Housing Recovery, um, who kind of oversees and coordinates with them and is kind of the day-to-day -day management. Some of our uh, key services you'll find here, and I'll want to call out a little bit around food delivery. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, as was, is not surprising, the reason that people leave uh, isolation and leave quarantine is to put food on the table, either literally or figuratively. And so Get Food NYC is actually a program that was run by our Department of Sanitation. That was the city agency that was identified as having the assets and the talents to be able to get emergency food out to people, especially early on in the pandemic, when people were in their homes and um, uh, oftentimes not able to uh, get out to an open grocery store to provide for themselves, regardless of whether they had been exposed to or infected with COVID-19. The Get Food continues to be our most requested service uh, from our resource navigators and provides emergency home food delivery to up to two members of the household. Um, there are logistical reasons and financing reasons, and uh, I would say just kind of lack of data reasons, but that has become the, that was the parameter set in the beginning, but it's definitely something that we're looking into as we try to drill down uh, into the reasons that people still find it challenging to isolate or quarantine. Now that we do our best to meet the various dietary preferences and restrictions of people in our city, um, and that doesn't just extend to vegetarian, kosher, and halal, but also working with uh, vendors who specialize in, before, in producing Latinx and Pan-Asian options. Uh, next slide. Another piece of our support services for people who are choosing to isolate at home is our take care package. So everyone who is identified through contact tracing is offered a take care package, which includes PPE. So it includes a surgical grade mask, as well as some hand sanitizer, and then certain monitoring equipment, like a digital thermometer and a pulse oximeter. And I will drop a link into the chat box later on. But the booklet itself is a really wonderful asset that we've developed. It's available online. And I think just the, the uh, thought that went into to producing the content and really trying to detail for someone how to achieve isolation and quarantine in their home was really beautifully done. We have Dr. Madad's uh, expertise and guidance to thank for that. Um, contacts can also request as part of their take care package an at-home testing kit. So people aren't uh, faced with the decision to either leave quarantine and uh, get tested or uh, go without a more definitive resolution as to whether they've actually developed COVID-19. Next slide. 
So before we turn it over, really turn our attention to the hotel program, I want to talk a little bit about our successes and challenges in running the resource navigation program for individuals separating at home. I think the number of agencies that we were able to bring together to get a program off the ground by June 1st was really impressive. Um, we then later undertook the work of building the resource navigation customer relationship management platform back into the contact tracing system before they existed in two entirely separate uh, platforms. And it actually has done a, a great job of improving visibility in these critical handoffs that we have between our contact tracers and our resource navigators. Um, and then we have been able to expand the reach of our resources since the launch of the resource navigation program of June of 2020. And in particular, I, I alluded before to figuratively the need to put food on the table. Not surprisingly, one of the most common reasons that people were leaving their home, especially during quarantine, was the fact that they felt the need to continue to go to work. And we can't downplay how critical uh, being able to make that month's rent, being able to pay for medication is for so many of the individuals that we're serving. And so as we made that transition into the integrated platform, it allowed us to better index many of the cash assistance resources that are available to New Yorkers, um, regardless of documentation status. So we really increased our communication around paid sick leave, which has both city, state, and federal components. Um, and then um, we're able to uh, refer people into other sources of cash assistance if for whatever reason they didn't meet the criteria for some of these government funded programs. There are certain challenges that remain for us, however. Things like childcare and adult care are, are not resources that we, adequate, that we have available to people. So really finding a substitute for hands-on care when someone becomes ill but they're responsible for other me members of the household um, it's still something that we're, we're looking for solutions for. Most often we tell people if they're in that situation, you should go to the hotel where there will be staff on hand who can help you. I think another thing that we uh, realized is that we're so happy we made the transition into an integrated information system platform. However, there's no good time to roll it out. And there are certainly some uh, bumps in the road, some challenges, some growing pains that we endured during a time when uh, post Thanksgiving, we are also dealing with an influx of cases into our city. And then lastly, um, having an integrated information systems platform does allow you to monitor, even at the community-based organization level, the status of your work in process and really hold ourselves accountable for connecting people to services within 24 hours. Yet and still, there is a layer of management that we have to learn how to do in a time where a lot of our interactions are virtual um, that cannot be substituted merely by uh, monitoring what's in the system. There still is the, the need to understand how people are prioritizing work, managing their workforce. Um, and it is one of the, the costs, one could say, one of the, the extra sources of energy you need to expend to be able to get the benefit of having different CBOs leverage their local knowledge. So with that, I'll talk a little bit about the hotel program just to set up Dr. Madad. Um, again, what we really stress for people and we're really excited to celebrate our, um, now it's 11,000. Uh, guests and growing in our hotel program since June uh, is the Take Care Hotel. Um, it is free to stay there. It is free to be transported there. Um, we try to stress that there are amenities. You will get free Wi-Fi. You'll get cable TV and really let people know that it's not a substitute for a hospital. I think there was a concern that this was a medical facility in the beginning and it was actually off-putting when all that people saw in the news were EDs that were overrun with, with COVID patients spilling out into the hallway. Um, we have medical professionals on site because, especially as we entered into a realm of community-based contact tracing, where people were coming in early in their COVID infection, not being discharged from the hospital to the take care hotels, um, people, people can become sick quite quickly. And so it is important to have some staff on site doing light monitoring and clinical support. Um, Dr. Vidad, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about the design of the program. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Johnson. That was wonderful. So I'm just going to very quickly, in, in a high-level fashion, talk a little bit about the infection prevention and control considerations. And obviously, health and safety and IPC is at the cornerstone of everything that ha that's being done. Um, and so just very briefly, when we're looking at the hotel setting, obviously, you want to adapt infection prevention and control um, strategies to this creative environment to ensure that obviously we have the best process in place based on the latest public health guidance. So anything from you know looking at the floor plan and at having designated you know clean and soiled utility rooms, having yawning and doffing areas, 
and the like, housekeeping, linen management, food services, all of those obviously are essential services and looking at it through an infection prevention lens and preventing that cross contamination. PPE and transmission based precautions. So certainly obviously caring for um, you know, confirmed clients that have COVID-19 and ensuring that the PPE uh, matches obviously the type of care that's being provided. Supply and equipment, really important. And as Dr. Johnson mentioned, you know, looking at the type of clinical acuity that you're going to be providing care for and making sure you have the adequate supply and equipment uh, to go along with it. So all these are different types of considerations uh, certainly to, to look at. And this requires a lot of planning, thought, and ensuring you have a multidisciplinary team that's able to kind of walk through and see how to look at all of these different processes from an IPC lens. The next one. Um, and then when we talk about health and safety, really important about the education and training that's being provided both to the staff that are manning these um, isolation quarantine hotels, as well as those going out in, in the field, so the resource navigators, community engagement specialists and the like. So the image that you have, um, for example, on, on my left, um, is you see an image of um, a training happening at one of the isolation quarantine hotels in New York City, where we're talking about the different processes that are that we have in place. And certainly, as you're retrofitting a hotel, you're looking at you know what that donning and doffing space looks like, you know where that um, PPE card is and the like. And so, making sure that uh, you know all staff are familiar, both clinical and non-clinical, where things are, ensuring their safety, ensuring knowing that they they understand the guidance that is being provided. And this obviously is on an ongoing basis. So as guidance changes or, you know, uh, we learn more about the disease and, and the virus and there are changes in public health guidance, which is normal. We're certainly obviously making sure that you're providing that education and training on an ongoing basis. And uh, on the other image, you're seeing uh, training take place with community engagement specialists and resource navigators, ensuring that as you're going out in the community, making contacts um, with the general public, that they obviously know not only the type of PPE they're wearing, but how to put it on uh, safely and effectively. As simple as putting a, a mask and glove on, really important to obviously understand the nuances there and preventing that cross-contamination to themselves. Um, and then also understanding the policy and the guidance uh, that goes along with it. So health and safety is at the cornerstone of everything that we do. Um, and then lastly, I'll just um, end with just mentioning a quick publication that we um, have available on the, our um, uh, New York City Health and Hospitals website. And it talks about a little bit more of the infection prevention and control considerations and the environmental health and safety in these um, isolation quarantine hotels. So it gives you a deep dive all the different topics I talked about and giving you templates, visual cues, um, and the like. And so certainly, if you're interested, um, you know, to uh, click on that particular link. So with that, I'm going to hand it back um, and uh, we're happy to take questions at the end. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. An, an incredible amount of work and the sophistication of the, of the programs that you guys have stood up. Um, I and and also I think it's helpful to hear about you know where the where the gap still you know where where are you guys uh, still you know wanting to um, to build out more and I think we can get to back to some of those during the question and answer period and there are a couple of good questions in the in the chat box um, as well. We'll, we'll, we'll get right back to those. Um, I do wanna go ahead and bring on uh, Dr. Lozada and Dr. Wei uh, to talk about um, their experience in the Indian Health Service in the Navajo area. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. So I'm Dr. Mia Lozada and today we'll be talking about uh, a slightly different setting in terms of population as compared to New York City. Uh, we work here in the Navajo Nation in Gallup, New Mexico in rural north um, western New Mexico and we'll talk about the um, supported isolation and quarantine hotel that we stood up here in uh, March of last year. So for context, for those of you who haven't been out here to the Navajo area, um, Navajo Nation itself sits in the Four Corners region of the Southwest, does not go into Colorado. It's about 27,000 square miles, about the size of South Carolina or so. Um, and uh, here, the circled in red is where Gallup itself sits. Um, we're about 25 miles from the Arizona border, and we have a population here of a little over 20,000 individuals um, who, and technically here in Gallup, we are are off the reservation, but there's a lot of area surrounding us, even within our town that's reservation itself. 
This is Gallup India Medical Center, which is where we work. We are an Indian Health Service uh, facility. It was opened in 1961, um, soon after IHS was formed in 1955, which took over from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this is only important for context in terms of when you have an infrastructure that looks like this and you're trying to significantly ramp up and change um, your system um, for COVID preparations, it makes it exceedingly challenging using such an old facility. So what happened here in, in Gallup in terms of COVID, um, in terms of how, how hard we were hit and what we had to do to try to uh, mitigate community spread? This was from August um, from the New York Times, um, hardest places, hardest hit places uh, across the, the country, I should say, where Gallup for many, many weeks and months continued to top a list that nobody wants to be the top of in terms of per capita, uh, both cases and confirmed deaths. And we continue to be you know, toggling in the top three um, for both of these categories, even to now. And, and you can see that many of these areas um, share some similarities in terms of the characteristics of these regions. Um, that's where New York City and Gallup are right next to each other, um, which, which is maybe why we're on this talk together. So looking at the social vulnerability index that the CDC has, I think has been helpful for us in terms of actually characterizing um, what are the, the characteristics of our town, of our community that have made us so hard hit. Um, and you can see here that the of the different um, categories that are listed, um, and I should in the very, very tiny print on the right are the different counties across New Mexico with, um, the highest at the top are the least socially vulnerable. And down at the bottom is the county with the highest social vulnerability index. And that would be our county, McKinley County. And so this is to say that, you know, when you're trying to stand up um, some sort of community mitigation tool in terms of COVID here specifically, that the community and the county and the state really needs to be aware of who is being impacted the most by COVID to be able to shape a program that fits those individuals specifically. So for our county, we were finding it was individuals that had social, lower socioeconomic status, were Native American, were living in multi-generational homes. Um, I Many times we would call patients to, to let them know of their positive status, inquire about their home isolation option, and they would say that they live in a house, uh, a three bedroom house with two bathrooms. And you think, okay, that's probably possible for them to isolate um, pretty safely at home, only to come to find out that they're sharing that space with you know, 10, 11 other individuals. And, and quickly your plan for safe isolation changes. And we needed to figure out what alternative options we had. Um, we also found that there were many individuals um, who were living with substance use disorders um, who, had, who were really up the population hardest hit. Um, so we, we have about a third of the population here um, who live on the reservation, lack running water um, and electricity as well. And so when that, those factors were really important into to isolating safely, um, that many times an, al an alternate option needed to be created or found. And so um, as folks are, are trying to, to gear up um, plans, we need to make sure that we're really tailoring to the individuals themselves. And here we can see, you know, in terms of the, the burden in terms of race uh, here in New Mexico, those who are indigenous, our, our American Indian Alaska Native population has been at least four times um, um, with a higher rate than, than all, all other races, which has been a, a profound um, experience here um, among our community. Hi guys, it's Jenny Way. Um, so I think it's also really hard to talk about uh, the COVID, um, how COVID has hit Gallup without really focusing on uh, some of the challenges that we've had for decades, for generations, right? And these are, of course, by definition, the vulnerabilities that have made these populations more vulnerable in times of disaster and pandemic. So one of the, one of the uh, lists you also don't want to be at the top of is alcohol-related deaths in the United States. So unfortunately, New Mexico for the last two decades has had the most number of deaths per 100,000 people. So you can see here on average, we have 28 per 100,000 uh, people uh, in, on average in the United States. And in New Mexico, we're at 51 deaths per 100,000 people. And if you actually focus again on keeping in mind that we are in Gallup, New Mexico, which is in McKinley County, the county with the highest social vulnerability index per the CDC, 
That social vulnerability index doesn't quite exactly incorporate substance use, but of course we know that a lot of these are inextricably linked with a lot of the, the criteria that we're seeing there in terms of socioeconomic status, et cetera. So keeping that number in mind, 28 deaths per 100,000 here in McKinley County, we're at 166 deaths per 100,000 in terms of uh, in alcohol related deaths. And not surprisingly, American Indians and Alaska Natives bore the highest burden of alcohol related death at 170 per 100,000. So again, as Dr. Lozada was saying, it's so important for you to know the population that is vo most vulnerable to be able to tailor your community mitigation strategies to that population. So we knew that uh, this population was gonna be very, very hard hit and it wouldn't make sense for us to open up uh, mitigation strategies, hotel programs, et cetera, without being able to incorporate people with substance use disorders, for example. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the other uh, isolation centers, alternate care facilities in our region do not take people with substance use disorder, but we knew this was going to be a huge challenge for us um, as we were starting to pan for the, uh, plan for the pandemic. So again, let's talk about what happened here in New Mexico. So we have a detox facility in town that holds people like a sobering center and upwards of 100 people per night pre-pandemic. Uh, back about a year ago, we was holding about 100 people per night in a very, very congregate setting in, a, in an area where people were all kind of wandering around together all night until they were sober enough to be able to be released. We were, were trying to cut that, cut that uh, capacity down 50%, but because we're a small community, we're the only level three trauma center in the whole area, we knew that uh, if we cut that in half, we were gonna have an overwhelming number of people overflowing our emergency departments. Already we were starting to feel it where people were not able to go to these congregate settings and were 30, 40 people in the emergency department uh, impairing the flow and uh, not being able to really uh, uh, safely, safely house them. Our very first case in, in McKinley County was on March 18th. Um, and around this time, we continue to get phone calls. What are we going to do with this population? You know, and honestly, a lot of us started to put together some money. Um, we were taking donations from various, uh, you know, from various other people in town to try to put up some money for hotel rooms for people. And I still remember that first, um, the first uh, couple weeks, we were able to put together about three thousand dollars, and we were so excited about that. And we thought, well, I think we're going to get through this pandemic, you know, <laughs> with with this amount of money. Um, Unfortunately, not, not uh, seeing that far ahead, but what was fantastic was we were able to start to partner with um, the New Mexico Department of Health with um, who was able, as well as a lot, of, uh, a lot of what New York City talked about in terms of putting together FEMA funds, as well as CARES Act funds to start to fund some more of these hotel rooms. So our first isolation hotel is actually the first hotel isolation program established in the whole Four Corners region on March 24th. And around that time, we had, you know, about a dozen folks in the hotel program, either quarantining um, or isolating, waiting for their, you know, with symptomatic, uh, symptomatic COVID. As I've, as I've been foreshadowing, unfortunately, on April 6th, uh, we had an outbreak at our detox facility where we had an, the first person was tested positive. And we found that in the, he had spent three of the last seven days in the detox program, had exposed over 170 people. And ultimately, when we were able to find all of these folks, 75% were positive with COVID. So you can imagine in our small community here, the cases of COVID shot up and the need for these isolation uh, sites shot up. So in the course of the first uh, week or the couple weeks of uh, April, we quickly expanded into uh, needing four different motels throughout the, throughout the city. We had upwards of 140 to 160 people in the program. And again, tailoring to our population. Can you guys take people who may be going into, may go into withdrawal when they're in the hotel program? Absolutely, where else are they gonna go? They have no place else to go safely. So we were really, really ramping up the medical oversight as well to make sure that they would be delivered medication to help with alcohol withdrawal to make sure that it was as safe as possible for them. And I think it really was the partnership of our hospital along with the community, along with the state, uh, state um, uh, financial funding that was able to make it possible for us to safely house a lot of these folks that are pretty high risk medically, um, not just alcohol withdrawal, but having many other medical problems that would otherwise have no other place to go. Uh, so we tried our very best to not have a lot of restriction, uh, uh, restrictive criteria um, and just to make sure that they did not need to be in the hospital. Even now, we actually have a lot of people on oxygen at the hospital, at the hotel, because as you, as Dr. Lozada mentioned, 
So many of our patients lack electricity and running water and simply cannot plug in a concentrator at home because they don't have the electricity to be able to do that. Or we hear stories of people putting in four or five different extension cords to extend into grandma's, grandma's trailer 400 feet away. So as of now, from March of last year till today, we've housed over 1,600 people in our program um, with the help of an incredibly supportive volunteer staff that have come from all over the country, in, from San Francisco to New York City. And it's been an incredible collaboration. Um, this is a little bit of a uh, graph of the positive cases we've had at our, at our Indian Medical Center. You can see we had that little outbreak back in April. We thought it was a big outbreak, but in retrospect was a little outbreak. Um, and, uh, and so that was a lot of the reflection of the, uh, at, of the outbreak at our detox facility right after, shortly after the first week of April. And then um, unfortunately we got hit very, very hard again in November and December. We thought April was bad, but at least in April we could, we could um, transfer our patients over to ICUs in Albuquerque and in the rest of the state. Unfortunately, by two months from two months ago, every place was full. It was not uncommon for us to have to transfer, call 10, 12, 14 different hospitals across the Four Corners region to find an ICU bed for our patients. And they would have to wait days in order to uh, in the emergency department. And so as you can see, it is absolutely critical for our rural site to have places to safely transfer or discharge our patients to. So the hotel program remained that ability to be able to make beds available in the hospital, in the ED, so that we could continue to try to um, triage as safely as possible. And similar to what New York was discussing uh, in terms of what the structure of their program is, um, we were really trying to incentivize folks to stay in um, their hotel rooms as much as possible, and we would provide them with any other services. So we would provide lodging, meals. We had a contact here in town. Nobody was willing to provide transportation for individuals who were COVID positive in the beginning of the pandemic. So it was a friend of a friend who was willing to, to drive folks between hospital and our, and our hotel program. We had wonderful collaboration with the PIH program, um, COPE, that works out here, um, which has been phenomenal that they really fielded when we had you know, 150 individuals in hotel rooms, they fielded the non-medical calls that were coming through to help get folks books and coloring books and radios and whatever they needed to be able to stay in place. Um, and then we would provide the medical oversight and coordinate with that. People would get in-person um, evaluations. We would bring medications to them as well. Um, and if they were stable enough to not need an in-person um, provider evaluation each day, then they would get a phone call by a medical provider um, instead. Um, we have chaplains working with us, Navajo interpreters, Zuni interpreters, native medicine, blessed um, healing herbs so that we could distribute those to the patients um, who could warm up water to make tea in their microwaves um, and could still um, maintain many of their um, cultural beliefs um, throughout the course of their isolation as well, which was hugely important as many of them were losing family members outside of isolation. And we had a wonderful IPAB program, not only for um, group visits, um, meetings, telemedicine, but as well as connecting with family on the outside as well, um, which was hugely helpful for individuals to try to allow them to stay inside. We'll just conclude by saying that um, I think what this program has taught us is that people obviously, you know, were those that were most vulnerable were hit hard, you know, by the pandemic. And we realize that we as a community really need to be focusing more on these. These have been existing issues for decades. And what we found out is that housing first works, that if you actually are able to provide folks with the basic necessities, uh, they're able to start to work towards more positive goals and contribute positively to society. We were actually able to get over 45 people into uh, inpatient rehab programs, alcohol rehab programs across the country through just having them be stable in a place for a moment where we can get them to fill out the application, the lab work, et cetera. And uh, so these are just some pictures of our patients' artwork and they were incredibly talented. This was one that was given to one of our volunteer staff. Ahiehe means thank you in Navajo. Um, and then finally, just wanting to say, this is a, a, a letter that was sent to us by one of our patients who was being discharged to the rehab program. And essentially what uh, he's saying, he's thanking us for helping him. He has an addiction problem and the first responders helped by talking to him um, and connect him with a, uh, with a, um, with a, a treatment program, a healing, a, a healing center is what he calls it.
So this is just a list of all the collaborators. It looks like an intimidating list, but realizing that it's really just one person behind each of these big organizations that needs that connection to be able to uh, put together um, these important programs for our community. I'll stop there and I'm um, oh, happy to take questions at the end as well. It's fantastic. I'm, I have to say I'm so moved every time you, you hear it tell the story. Um, you know, and I think it's actually a perfect transition uh, to Dr. Bilmes because, um, you know, when we're thinking about investing in these types of programs, we're, we're thinking about not just the short game, but the long game. You know, how, how do we bring the crisis to heal as quickly as possible? But also, how does that translate into building out a public health sort of system approach that really does underpin the health of our communities going forward and our people going forward. Um, and so Dr. Belmas, I, I know that you, you often say you come in to do the, the money talk <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's so critical, that's so critical now. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, so thank you, um, thank you so much. And um, these are, this is, this is, really an amazing uh, number of sessions and very moving and very, um, very sort of humbling uh, to listen to. So um, usually I come, I come on uh, at the end of panels and I'm usually Dr. Gloom saying that the wonderful ideas being discussed are expensive and that there is um, no way to pay for them. Uh, in this case today I'm in the kind of unusual position of delivering some good news which is that this kind of program is uh, at least partially self amortizing that there is actually likely to be funding that can be used for it and that this is a pretty cost effective way of spending public funds and this is based on some uh, research that we did in Massachusetts I'm going to share my screen here um, and um, Ah, are we um, here now? Now, um, oops, I'm going to start um, from the beginning here. Uh, this is based on some research we did in Massachusetts, where we had the kind of audacious idea that actually this program might even pay for itself. And so, just to recap the key points. Um, as we know, and as we've heard and, and read, um, these isolation and quarantine programs are can be effective at reducing transmission. We've seen that uh, historically and certainly in Korea and Germany and, and elsewhere um, this time around. And as Margaret pointed out, this is likely to become even more important now as new outbreaks kind of crop up and we are in a whack-a-mole world where we're trying to contain such outbreaks. But the key obstacle to, to um, compliance is really financial. And people can't afford it, or they can't afford the wraparound services, or they can't afford um, uh, caring for others. And so when we think about this, we kind of have to think about it in terms of um, what are the costs and the benefits of providing a program like this. So based on the cost model that I will just very briefly outline to you in Massachusetts, we found that the total cost uh, of a supported isolation quarantine program between February 1st and August or 211 days, just modeling that that would be the uh, remaining days of the pandemic would be from 300 to 570 million, depending on the rate of transmission and the number of um, cases per day and the number of contacts that each uh, individual had. However, uh, that may seem that may seem like a large number, but it's actually not such a large number because the reduced transmission offsets the cost to the state. In Massachusetts, we found that the cost to the state of um, providing medical care was around $2,500 per person, and of which 43% to 50% is borne by the state. And the actual cost of um, providing a supported quarantine program was lower than that. And finally, the good news, which I'll show you at the end, is that there's actually a lot of money in the proposed federal stimulus bill, which is likely to pass, which is uh, usable specifically for things that would include contact tracing and supported quarantine. And states will pretty soon will be in the 
fairly um, unusual position themselves are trying to figure out how to allocate these funds and trying to understand what are the most cost-effective ways to treat um, and to prevent uh, uh, transmission, particularly in underserved communities. So just to take a, a quick kind of look at our model, um, we modeled in Massachusetts, found that a seven day quarantine cost that the, the weighted average uh, was about $403 per person, which is um, not very high. Uh, that is assuming that 95% would quarantine at home and that 5% would be quarantining in facilities. So the facility cost would be higher, about $1,300 per person over the course of the seven days. Um, at about three hundred and eighty-five dollars for the for the at-home um, quarantine cost, and this is based on the idea that we would pay people fifty dollars a day, which is the same amount that we pay for jury duty, um, to do the public service of being able to quarantine at home. And this is interestingly, there is a uh, nineteen thirty-eight law on the books in Massachusetts, which um, allows for payment for quarantine, which in today's money is is quite close to the fifty dollars a day. So this assumes that there would be, we based this model on looking at the average transmission rates and average contacts per day and average daily cases uh, over the last nine months. So um, this uh, basically assumes that we would have between 500,000, which would be kind of the, the low end, uh, to 1.3 million people that would require a quarantine. Uh, that includes the infected individuals plus 4.25 uh, contacts per person. And uh, it's like, as I um, uh, showed the cost of this, the on average would be 2260, which is below the actual $2,500 medical cost. So um, given the fact that we are at the, um, lower end and given uh, given that, that, that we have a reasonable vaccine rollout happening, I mean, that's a, a big assumption, but assuming that that, um, that is the case, you know, we're looking at probably in Massachusetts and uh, something around the order of 300, 350 million dollars in costs. Now, um, if we look at that, one of the first questions is what is the return on investment on that or, or, or you know, how cost effective is that use of money? So to try and answer that question, we took a look prospectively at a, at a kind of counterfactual um, to try and ask uh, if, um, if we didn't do this, what would be the cost? So we asked what would be the likely medical bill? I mean, using uh, the, the um, average number of cases per day over the last few months, which has been uh, 1,200, uh, on average, in fact, yesterday was very close to that in Massachusetts, um, and as spreading at the uh, average um, transmission rate from uh, 2020, we found that the total medical cost in the state alone would be 1.1 billion, of which, of course, 43% um, would be borne by the state. And we found that, uh, I mean, if the program could reduce the transmission rate even for one day of this group, which would be 1,200 people plus the, um, the contacts, you know, there would be significant savings to the $300 million program. And even at lower rates of transmission, even at significantly lower rates of transmission, um, there would still be savings because um, every additional um, case avoided is, uh, is essentially money saved. And this was a a very narrow way of considering the, the um, counterfactual because we, we didn't include a number of the costs that the speakers outlined today. For example, um, we were just hearing about the, the reduced cost potentially of treating alcoholism due to the benefits of, um, of uh, having people in, in facilities um, during their transition. And there are a whole range of costs which are um, in economics kind of packaged under the cost of, of uh, exhaustion, you know, which include uh, the, the cost of, um, pay, of paying rent or not having money for rent, the cost of running out of medications and so forth, which are associated with not having these quarantine wraparound services. I um, finally want to point out that we actually are, uh, the, the, you know, the really good news, Massachusetts has, has uh, and you know, this is just one state, but we've obviously spent uh, overall a huge amount of money so far um, in things like, this is the Massachusetts rate where we've spent 
um, almost 1.1 billion already on PPE and, and hospitals and supplemental payments to uh, hospitals and 66 to 100 um, million on contact tracing. But we haven't really leveraged uh, the, the, the full value of this. We haven't gotten the full bang for the buck particularly out of the contact tracing money because of the lack of uh, clear spending on setting up the um, supported quarantine and wraparound services. And we are about to have a situation where um, the funding in the stimulus bill provides in addition to a significant amount of general state and local aid, there's $46 billion specifically targeted toward testing contact tracing and mitigation of which the things we're talking about today would fall particularly into this area and particularly in medically underserved areas. So states are pretty soon gonna find themselves in the really happy um, but sort of complicated position of trying to figure out where, where is the, the best allocation of the marginal dollar and how do, we, how do we prioritize that? So I would suggest that probably um, the, the spending priorities are around helping underserved communities, preventing transmission, and spending in such a way that has offsets to the states and has, has savings. Um, and this falls, uh, the, the supported quarantine we've heard about today falls absolutely, ticks all three boxes. And so it's probably one of the most uh, cost-effective ways to, to um, fight the, the remainder of the pandemic in a way that uh, achieves goals and um, at a, uh, what you could call financially a, a sort of very, very um, uh, positive return on investment for every public dollar that's expended. So our paper, which provides this is, um, was out uh, today. This was, um, uh, paper um, written, uh, led certainly by Dr. Bordeaux and by uh, my amazing student, Jessica Cashel and others, and Marie Sazdi and Megan Mishra and Anne Hoyt. And um, we have a pretty robust financial model, both for the cost and for the quarantine, which is available by request, which any state could adapt to their own costs. So thank you very much. Awesome. Um... Thanks so much. It is it is good to get good news uh, from uh, somebody that knows something about money. <laughs> I think we are. It, it will it will be whiplash. I will tell you, uh, Dr. Gomez, for uh, those of us in public health and those of us who've been you know really uh, chomping at the health equity bid for a long time uh, to kind of be in this moment of like, oh wait, we have uh, we we have we, there is funding available and and how should we spend it? So I, I think that's fabulous. I would love to um, have everybody. Um, if you can uh, turn on their video and we can uh, do some of the question and answer. I, I, I think our audience has a um, few, I, I see Mary Gray, it's awesome. Always, you always ask the most astute questions here in, in, in the question and answer um, box. I think I'm gonna um, uh, invoke a little bit of the host privilege and in, uh, in modifying a, a bit of your questions, Mary. Um, around, especially the first question, because it does get to something that I uh, struggle with a little bit. Um, and I wonder how it can be worked out uh, a bit better. So there seems to be sort of a tension, at least I notice it in Massachusetts, where you know you want to make use of community members who really know their communities well and the community-based organizations that they are often involved with that are you know really tailored to potentially meeting the needs of community members. I think that, uh, but as you transition over to trying to build out and have a bit more standardized approach and make sure that everyone in every community has access uh, to, to high quality services, you know, there becomes an issue where I, I have felt concerned a bit in Massachusetts that, you know, gosh, we are leaning in on the community resources of some of the most impoverished communities in order to support people in quarantine and isolation. Okay, it's wonderful if they happen to have an amazing food bank. Okay, great, you know, wonderful. But like, what about the community that is also poor that does not have such an awesome, robust food bank? I mean, can we, you know, start to both make sure that we're leveraging uh, community-based organizations and community members uh, with the expertise and knowledge about their communities, while also making sure that we are, um, you know, applying a high standard of support uh, across the board? 
I don't know, let me, let me, I'll ask um, Dr. Johnson, you first, and then Dr. Lozada and Wei, uh, maybe you guys have some insight. Yeah, I, I can try taking this first, and I'm sure there'll be so much that others want to, to chime in about. But I think one of the ways that we've approached this in New York City is by saying, for example, let's take the case of food. We are going to use one of our city agencies that is highly effective as an operator to set a standard for the delivery that people should be able to expect. We'll get you it within 48 hours. If we need to do a triage order, we can rush it. But it's through those partnerships and the management of those partnerships that we're going to be able to meet the local needs. So the reason that we're able to be provide this like range of services is because of the vendor contract management capacity that DSNY or Department of Sanitation possesses. I think if you want to take the example of our resource navigator program, it's managed by a city office that then contracts with CBOs that span all five boroughs that have different language capacities. And uh, they get to tap in, of course, to those city resources when they're available and with paid sick leave, of course, the state and federal resources. Um, at the same time, if they find shortfalls in what's available locally, the apparatus that we have around HRO allows us to provide them additional funding to kind of build them up in areas where they are small so that you aren't punished by where you live in the city, which is just gonna perpetuate a lot of the disparities that led to the situation we're in to begin with. I think another thing that's really a point of pride for the resource navigation program in particular is the jobs that we are creating. And so the Housing Recovery Office has this particular mandate for developing uh, careers for people, for employing people. And so to be able to say we created 400 plus jobs of people from the community, expanding the capacity of these CBOs to hire and employ people um, is another way that we're trying to build up and invest in the places that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. And something that is on our mind, we are also really excited about the expansion into mitigation services and what that means for our ability to continue some of these as just part of the ongoing response to COVID. Um, and we're thinking about what does it, what what is the next iteration of this core that we've been able to build up, this workforce, um, because they provide so much value. Um, and it would be a shame to, to lose the knowledge and skills that they've developed in the past year. Oh, community health workers, here we come. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Lozada and Dr. Wei, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I think I echo a lot of what Dr. Johnson said. We really tried to keep a lot of the, uh, you know, tried to keep things local. Um, I think on, on the one hand, you it, it could be perceived as a strain, but on the other hand, we were able to provide a lot of um, employment for the restaurants in town that were helping to, to deliver breakfast, lunch, and dinner, along with the uh, along with the hotel and support staff. I think they were all extremely and continue to be extremely grateful that they uh, are that they're busy, you know, and they, they continue to get a paycheck. The one other thing I wanted to highlight is that we at Gallup Indian Medical Center, uh, we are going out to, to do check-ins with folks and we do bill them as medical visits. Uh, so that's one of the other things to try to advocate for in, in partnership with the local uh, local medical centers is if they can kind of bill as home visits, especially during around this time last year, we weren't doing any visits. And so uh, that was actually really helpful to be able to do, I don't know, 10,000 10, plus. Um, I just got the number 34,000 home visits is what it's counted as. Fantastic. Um, I mean, it really is heartening, right? To see after this very dark year, this, um, you know, I don't know, green shoots, am I allowed to use that? Um, you know, of like, maybe we're gonna, you know, emerge from this with, um, you know, a much more sophisticated and kinder and, you know, more built out, health system and public you know, health system. Um, and one of the things that I have uh, really been thinking about with, with the Berkman Klein Center folks, including Mary Gray, um, you know, is this issue around the, um, you know, what is the information and tech uh, infrastructure that we want for our public health system going forward? How do we want it to interdigitate with our medical care system? Um, and, you know, how do we want it to be structured so that, you know, that social determinants of health and, you know, things that are impacting the health of patients that are not sort of popping up routinely in medical records, you know, that we start to, um, you know, have that system in place so that we have some communication between public health and our, and our, and our medical care system. Uh, right now, so much of our, our IT systems and, uh, you know, are run off of fax machines and, you know, very old 
old systems, you know, which are very cumbersome. And, um, and I, I just wondered either, either uh, New York team, Navajo team, um, whether you had some thoughts about or even dared yourself to think about uh, what are the um, systems you'd like to build. And I think uh, Mary Gray's specific question was about the resource navigator system being used. Um, and she had a specific question uh, about, you know, what were the features that made the pain of implementing it worth it? <laughs> um, I don't, so maybe, Amanda, we can start with you and then and zoom back out on the bigger question of IT. Sure, I can start by talking a little bit about the Resource Navigator CRM platform. So uh, in, the, in the sprint, to come up with a contact tracing platform that was gonna be ready on June 1st. A lot of attention was paid to making sure that we had a script that worked for our case investigators, that worked for the monitors, the folks who call people on subsequent days of their isolation and quarantine. And we wanted to be able to launch the resource navigation program at the same day, but just the reality of the work is we only have so many developers, you only have so many uh, system architects to go around. So the priority was getting a really strong contact tracing platform in place, and the resource navigation program was able to uh, function in its own separate system. Um, once some bandwidth opened up, and people also really just saw how popular the resource navigation program was. I mentioned before that we were really excited to celebrate 11,000 plus guests to our isolation and quarantine hotels. But to put that into perspective, we have shipped out 220 some thousand take care packages over the course of our program, and the take care packages only launched in August. And then the resource navigators have completed upwards of 190,000 referrals. So people are still doing this at home. That is their preference, and that is often their reality. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we got the same benefits that the contact tracing program um, was afforded by their use of the platform. So I'd say there's probably three areas. We used to have, and we still have this meeting every week between the tracing platform and the take care platform just to talk about handoffs. And now we can talk a little bit less about handoffs because by working in the same system and anyone who's been in a medical record at any point understands and feels this pain. We now can see what were the interactions leading up to this. We can see your case notes. So it just provides a more complete picture of the situation that you're trying to intervene on. Like why was this particular need? How, what is my best chance of getting back in touch with this person? Um, because unfortunately we have to use the word navigation because things can be so thorny and hard to come by, but we, we wanna do that work um, as, as well um, and as completely as possible. It also afforded us a better view into households. So we could see, um, you know, if I can't contact this person, is there somebody else in the household that I can um, assist or is that another way to get in touch with this person? Really, what is the household need as opposed to just what is this individual need? It is an operational benefit. The more concrete operational benefits is that we were spending a lot of time doing manual assignments. This person has this language preference. They live in this zip code. They should go to this community-based organization and this resource navigator. This is all stuff that can be automated. And again, we can invest more time into thinking about programming and then managing aging work in process. So what is what has not been touched within 24 hours, what has been open but hasn't been resolved in 48 hours, just having a lens into where that stands and who is, who is facing more challenges and then being able to unpack why those are is really important. Um, I mentioned before that CBOs preferentially serve a particular neighborhood. So you don't wanna penalize poor performers without really understanding what could be driving that um, change in performance. If it takes more time and it takes more effort to close the case for a person, you don't want to hold them to the same standard as the CBO, which has a particular resource that's just more readily available in their neighborhood. So that brings us kind of to my last point, which I think was the benefit of this platform, is being able to pull in some of that really good contact tracing data around demographics, around neighborhood, around um, is this a case for contact? What day in their isolation are they? Um, what... Um, being able to actually do stratifications by race and ethnicity and language to really hold ourselves accountable to achieving what it is we think that we are doing. Um, that, that has been a really impressive benefit of being able to pair, um, not have to work so hard to match contact tracing data with resource navigation by just treating it as part of one workflow. That's fantastic. I, uh, oh, well. Yeah, Dr. Lozada, maybe you want, okay. I don't have a significant amount to add. I think that was excellent from, from Dr. Johnson. I think the one thing that we've found in terms of rather than connecting systems is really leveraging our own, you know, electronic health record here and, and showing how many of these other kind of touches with healthcare or, or with a system 
can all be really added into our exist, existing EHR. So a lot of these home visits, what our CHRs, our community health representatives are doing, all of that, if we're keeping it in a more centralized place, then we can see all of those touches even within our EHR. We're, we're unique and lucky in that we are mainly one system to take care of a community as opposed to numerous different hospitals and clinics where the, the care is slightly more, you know, by definite, by, by nature, um, more disjointed. So um, I think we found a value you and keeping everything as centralized as possible. That's fantastic. Um, and I, I know there's there's a lot more uh, questions. We are at time. Um, I do. I, I would like to just thank our incredible guests. I think the you know there there are. I, I encourage anyone listening that wants to continue the conversation to certainly reach out to us to me. I uh, uh, am, you know, su super happy to uh, set up sidebar conversations. Um, I think there's a, there's probably a lot more to be said about the money. There's a lot more to be said about the eligibility criteria and accessing um, the the facility based services. Um, but uh, so just know that you know we we are here to um, you know to make that happen uh, if folks want to follow up. Um, and thank you so, so, so much to, to all of our guests and uh, our experts.